few things in life are as annoying as dealing with a broken bone or realizing that you're carrying too much stuff. So what would happen to someone's spirit if they were forced to endure both things not only at the same time, but also forever? Can you beat Fallout 4 while completely crippled and over-encumbered? You're gonna notice on your screen a series of numbers that are increasing at an alarming rate. Those of you with an eye for fashion will no doubt know that those represent time. In order to understand the pain I put myself through over the course of a single four-day period, you need the timer. It will help keep things in perspective. With my character as true to life as inhumanly possible, I immediately f***ed up by not being broken on every level. The curtains don't yet match the drapes. Using a console command after a joke I refused to let die, the condition of both my arms, both my legs, my chest, and my head are all set to zero. Thankfully, by Captain crunching my bones through the power of prayer, no amount of medicine will heal me. I can still use stim packs and other healing items while my limbs remain 100% broken at all times. Also in that command is a command that set my maximum carry weight to 1, so I'm always over encumbered. Unlike my New Vegas godless pacifist run that I did on a whim, this one I did not. I thought I had a pretty good handle on things after I assigned my special points but a series of misfortunes happened to land on my lap. I'm not ready for that, you're not ready for that, let's come back to it. These are how I assigned my special points so I could get a few useful perks as early as possible. The big three perks are Rooted, Aqua Boy, and Idiot Savant. Rooted adds 25 to both energy and real damage resistance when you're not moving. Aqua Boy coats your body in plastic wrap to keep you from taking radiation damage in various liquids, and Idiot Savant has been proven to be better at leveling you up quickly than maxed out intelligence. If you're wondering about Gordon, it's the most slug-like name I could think of. Completely crippled on every level now, a news bulletin told us about some possible rain later, and I hobbled towards the vault. See how fast I'm moving indoors? That was the game f***ing with me. This is me moving like someone who cares that they're about to become the dust that irritates my nose 200 years from now. It's so slow that if you stop for any reason, your guy will attempt to get into the dying position. Based purely on guesswork, I'd say it took me double digit minutes just to get to the vault. It was kind of them to hold off the end of the world just for me. I went down to the vault, got froze, thawed out, and the real game began. See that guy in the upper right? You're gonna love him, whether you like it or not. He's here, and he's not going anywhere anytime soon. Despite the cartoon guy walking faster than I do, I've got a few tricks up my skirt. First, there's the lifesaver. The only reason I continued this challenge in Fallout 4 after learning what comes next. The auto run button. Press it, and you walk automatically. Next, there's the melee attack shortcut discovered first by coal miners back in 2011. There is no special animation for a melee attack when your entire body is held together with tape, so doing a melee attack in third person still makes you lunge forward at the normal human speed, depending on what weapon you use. It's not something I used very often, because clicking every second to still move slower than sh** isn't worth doing. Had it not been for the ramp, my escape would have been stopped before it ever got above ground. I can't jump. That's a thing I can't do either. I might as well go through everything else. Let's see. I can't fast travel until level 30 because you need a perk to do it when you're over encumbered. And in third person, you can't reload a gun while you're moving. And you also can't look around while you're reloading in third person. That animation speed up doesn't work in first person, which makes swapping back and forth between melee weapons and gun weapons in first person and third person a f***ing nightmare that I hope you all have to experience before I force you to. Right now, you're probably wondering two things. Why isn't my vision playing with the fog machine, and why is there a fog machine out here in the first place? I installed a few mods to make this more fun to look at. I don't think there were any weird mods. If there were, we'll handle it together. The other is why my vision isn't getting blurry from my head injuries. It happened the first time, then never again. Nothing I did could fix it and make it work. And to be 95% honest, I did this for real. I didn't speed up the game to get somewhere quicker. I walked from Good Neighbor to Virgil's Cave while completely crippled and over-encumbered twice. If you have a problem with the vision thing, smash the dislike button. In this sea of tragedy, there's a little detail that made this more fun and exhausting than I ever thought possible. Carry weight means nothing. I can take every single object I find. You might have expected me to make the ultimate world of wood in what would one day be a historic site. I didn't go too crazy. By the time I left Sanctuary, I was all the way up to level 4, with Rooted, 
Lone Wanderer, and Idiot Savant as my perks. My only objective was efficiency. Going straight to Nick Valentine will save hours. Animals don't count as a friend, so Dogmeat tagged along once I finished stealing everything from his house. Some rooftop sniper handled most of the little monsters trying to get into the museum. I took care of those who were inside and met Preston Garvey, leader of the Minutemen, who got me a sick deal on a scooter and a squirt gun. I'm a man. I'm not playing on very easy, I'm playing on regular easy. I assumed that with my gun and pretty outfit, Yoshi wouldn't be an asshole when he woke up, but he was. With the raiders wiped clean, I had a frightening conversation with Preston, told him I would see him back in Sanctuary later, and continued towards Nick. My clown car pants came in handy in the diner when I bartered with Trudy as a payment for killing people in front of her establishment. A smidge closer to Diamond City, I cleared out the Super Kmart of its melons, stepped back outside just in time to miss 8 out of 10 shots with a handgun, and went back on my word. I used a switchblade to fly through the downtown commonwealth. I put a stop to that when the dust rolled in. As someone who once forgot about a lunchbox full of oranges they left in their locker over spring break, I know enough about orange dust to know that it doesn't go into any human hole. This game wouldn't do me dirty. There wasn't a chance in hell they'd let Dogmeat take his first swim lesson in this mild inconvenience. Hours into this adventure, I arrived in Diamond City, got a handful of face, sold everything I didn't need to the future of 7-Eleven delivery, convinced Ellie her boss was worth 200 caps, and set off across town. As I was about to leave, I watched a man, overcome by fear of the unknown, gun down his brother. Being the good person that I pretend to be, I brought his brother back from the dead. Now he is good as new, and the family will be forever grateful. I killed the super mutants at the base of Trinity Tower because they were there, and came to a realization. The Lone Wanderer perk is overrated. I don't need it. I need a real man. A big, green man. As with just about everything with this challenge, fighting up Trinity Tower was not all that difficult. Going against my instinct to run to cover was harder than taking lives or watching dog meat get cut in half. With the combination of effects of the perks I've mentioned, standing still and taking the punishment is a better option than trying to get to cover. You're so slow that in the time it takes to get to cover, you could have just killed whoever it was you were running from. With Strong now by my side for all of time, I tried to piss off a very big bird settled for a scrapbook photo, and entered Park Street Station. It turns out that by thinking Strong would go after someone who shoots him with a gun, I overestimated his intelligence. Down in the subway, the 10mm pistol I'd had since I crawled out of the Do Not Enter tunnel betrayed me by being wildly inaccurate. Missing shot after shot after shot when you're in spitting distance is frustrating in the most unfun way imaginable. The only thing I had going for me was that I was shooting in the right direction most of the time. I forgot to mention earlier that crouching isn't allowed, so sneaking gets defenestrated immediately. With a monster and a companion by my side, I slowly returned to the surface of the vault. Skinny Malone had the silly idea in his head that he was gonna stop me. They didn't even have time to react. I gave them that gift. Back in Diamond City, I explained where it was everything went wrong. Legends say it happened when a special sloth got somewhere he wasn't supposed to. That same blood sloshes through my arteries too. That's why I broke into someone's home and had a brief moment of existential dread as I thought I was gonna have to go back to the rocket station to get dog meat. I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Probably wouldn't have ended well for anyone. The hound got the scent of death from the cancer stick. I followed him for a time. A long time. It took me almost 45 minutes to walk from Diamond City to Fort Hagen by way of Germany's most ferocious beast. We're too far into this video and still have too much ground to cover for me to spend more than a few words here. All I'm gonna say is that I never plan on playing Fallout 4 without the Desperado Overhaul mod installed again. The main feature of the mod is cactuses. It adds a few other things too, but really it just gives the game a more New Vegas vibe. This hallway with a bunch of synths and a turret at one end and a me at the other is probably the best example of how having broken arms can impact your ability to fire a gun. It's almost impressive how many shots I missed. That being said, I deserve the pain of this for using a revolver. It's like grabbing a fishing net to catch bugs. Finally at Kellogg, yours truly had just the thing to wipe him from existence. One half jet, one half psycho, one half minigun, and one half a roll of gauze was all it took to be deconstructed by my murderer. The barrel was practically down his throat. I still missed half my shots, but justice prevailed. Another beautiful angel went through the strongification process, the Brotherhood arrived in the Commonwealth, and I spent the next 40 minutes walking back to Diamond City. The tide tucked its tail between its legs and ran back into the sea about halfway back to home base. I ran into the star of the greatest video of all time on the road, and as a collector of all things that exist, I had plenty of objects to trade for spray and prey. 
a legendary submachine gun that does explosive damage with every shot. I will admit that this new toy made Fallout 4 significantly easier. The accuracy problem still remains, as does literally everything else. At level 11, I took the Rad Resistance perk to instantly get plus 10 radiation resistance at all times. Nickel and Flatface pointed me towards Dr. Amari and Good Neighbor. I killed Swan because I'm the only abomination allowed to roam these streets. Found Good Neighbor, had a normal conversation with the guy at the gate, picked up a bobblehead in the hotel to earn a cool 5% more experience for the rest of time. Learned through Reader Rabbit Kellogg Edition that Virgil, an Institute Science Man, can help me get inside. And so began my quest to the Great Green Sea. This was what I was dreading from the moment the 30% decided to f*** me. Unlike Fallout 3, there are no major skips that I can pull off. Unlike Fallout New Vegas, I cannot fly through the air with a revolver. Let this serve as a lesson to the youth. If you're not looking forward to something, dive in head first and assume everything will work out. You're the main character of your life, you'll be fine. I put a good amount of thought into getting into Virgil's cave. Simply surviving the trip isn't enough. I need to be able to get back out of the glowing sea. Running out of supplies after 45 minutes is not an option. To that end, I did no additional planning whatsoever. The odds were decent that I had enough supplies to last until I died. 35 minutes after I left Kellogg's head, I hit the edge of the glowing sea. Wasn't too long after that, a deathclaw ripped my arm off. Your boy got himself stuck by a bridge with a deathclaw on each side. A lesser man would have ran, and I too would have ran if I knew how to run. Almost an hour after I set sail, I hit Virgil's cave, convinced him to help me get inside the Institute, and headed back to Diamond City. What I experienced was the Fallout 4 equivalent of spending 45 minutes driving your kids to the water park, letting them get one t-shirt that they have to share, and then going straight home. Does that sound sad? It should. The added pressure of only having 3 Rad X and 10 Rad Away remaining helped ever so slightly. You're not missing much of anything by me skipping back to Carbon Town. For those of you who didn't go to a Catholic high school like I did, that was a science joke. To take this even deeper, what I just said was a lie. I wasn't going back to Diamond City. The Courser was smart enough to go to the last place he knew I'd look for him. The greenest building in all the land. Let's go over my perks real quick. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Lucky Looter rank 1 and 2. Lone Wanderer rank 1. Idiot Savant rank 1 and 2. Aqua Boy and Rad Lad rank 1. Toughness rank 1 and 2 and Rooted rank 1. Despite only being level 13, ammo, damage, healing, these concepts are beginning to crumble. They no longer mean what they once did. Assuming, because there is no reason not to, that I didn't miss any shots, it's not uncommon to find more ammo on a gunner than it would have cost to euthanize him. I should have pointed out somewhere sooner that somewhere along the way, I set the difficulty up to hard. I'm sure you've noticed that some enemies that could be killed in 2-3 to three shots in other videos are taking far more damage. Atop the tower, I found the Courser. Lacking a missile launcher, the third best choice was to lay down a dozen mines. Safety in numbers, as they say. My gun tickled the make-believe man, I took shelter, and entered the free cam to watch Strong do a job for a real man. Moments later, Strong died. The Courser's death satisfied me greatly, I verified the sharpness of my blade, went back to Good Neighbor, sold a whole lot of garbage to my only fan, Amari said there was a train convention down in the church's basement, and I went to see for myself. It was nothing more than a sick joke, some lowlife's idea of a fun prank. Like spending 8 years telling your audience you've got a twin brother, as if God would actually make two of me. With the fish and chips out of the microwave, I had the ultimate decision to make. The ripples of which side of the fraction I land on will be felt throughout the rest of my life. Someone who was not with the railroad lied to me about what the railroad was, so the railroad is out. I can't fast travel until level 30. I wouldn't be able to get back into the Institute after I leave for the first time. The Minutemen have at least 8 missions that can send you just about anywhere on the map, which sounds traumatizing. That leaves the Brotherhood of Steel. Here's what's happening. At this point, I'm already tied to a chair. I'm just negotiating which teeth I can live without. If nothing else, I'd get to see just how long I could keep strong as a companion while siding with the Brotherhood of Steel, because their entire existence is based around wiping out mutants. Regardless of which team got the handicap of me joining them, I still had to get the chip decoded. The first step in helping the Brotherhood isn't completing the first step quest. It's saving them from all of us future Kirby Air Ride fans who went feral while waiting for a sequel. Inside Arcjet, I saw firsthand how much laser ammo I had, made a few weapon modifications, found the junk jet, sparked a fire under someone's ass, and hit the dead body jackpot. Each synth has ammo and each gun has more. It's a delight. Now you'd think that the junk jet would be a god tier weapon in this playthrough, 
but it's too annoying to use in general and I wasn't interested in dealing with bullet drop. Had I come through Arcjet earlier, I probably would have used it. Same goes for the gun I got from Buzz. Back at the station, Dance said the king wanted to speak to me up in his balloon, so I climbed inside the bird and flew through the sky. The Brotherhood's got a secret weapon, in addition to my new helmet, that'll save me from myself. The only thing standing between me and that reward is a super mutant behemoth. On my tool belt were a whole bunch of ways I could have handled that little man. I used the free gun attached to the vertebird to kill it. The bullet casings littering the ground will one day grow into bullet trees. In a way, I'm helping the planet. Baby's first nuclear ordinance was found inside a locked office at the fort. I cleaned up what I could in the basement, talked to Dance about his past, and was lost because there was no way to get back up to the Bridwin without fast traveling. Before giving up, I put my education to use for the last time by building my way up to the blimp. I got close, closer than any other timeline's mitten squad. A Google informed me that there was a transportation point on one of the landing pads. His Highness gave me my orders, and I was going back towards the end of the Earth. The power of flight is my secret weapon. With the Brotherhood's Vertiberg grenades, I can summon an aircraft to fly me anywhere on the planet. Or so I thought. This most likely was not the first time I've ever flown in a vertibird, but I do it so infrequently that I didn't know you could only fly to locations that you've discovered. The immense payoff of being able to fly straight to Virgil's cave in a matter of minutes, after it taking almost two hours to get there and back, was almost worth this entire playthrough. Accidentally finding myself in Skyrim wasn't a bad experience either. As Lydia, I've never been more prepared to construct the teleportation playset. This time around, the half-clown didn't even have time to get in my way. Maxon ordered me to ensure that Madison Lee joins the Brotherhood of Steel at any cost. The clown gave me her nose. I got blinked inside. Either the drugs or something more powerful than myself made the elevator ride invigorating. I found Father was taken aback by what walked through those doors, and I got to work. Dr. Madison Lee, as of right now, is an optional objective. I'm carrying somewhere around 1,500 pounds of stuff, but that's not enough. The machines sending up the air down in the Institute are more plastic than soul. By killing them, I can potentially weigh myself down all the way to the center of the Earth. True to life, the hard part came after the screaming and crying stopped. I had to deal with all the effects of the drug I took and the mess I'd made. Everyone was dead. I began my journey to the surface and committed crimes against humanity on a scale that shocked nobody. You knew this was coming. I didn't count all the creatures I killed in the Institute, but after I loaded into Purgatory, even more were waiting for me. I looted them all, every last one of them. I had 137 Institute pistols and more than 100 of most main synth armor pieces. I did good. God disagreed. Strong and I, that's right he's still here, flew back to the Pridwin. I told Dance the truth, bought everything I wanted as a youth but was told I couldn't have, and went through a series of unexpected failures. A Dr. Skara is now a Brotherhood of Steel scientist. I just have to find her and tell her. She's hiding out in a bowling alley. I knew that ahead of time. So I went as close as the bird would take me, dropped out into the f***ing war zone, dreamed I was playing Fallout 4 New Vegas, agreed with the robot that it was okay if I looked around, and the doctor isn't here yet. I flew back to Diamond City to find the doctor, ended up in the basement getting plastic surgery. Sadly, they can't put my eyes on the side of my head like a fish. The waypoint moved when I told it to. Mitten Squad goes bowling, the sequel, and we're back on track. Liberty Prime's gonna pop out of the Pridwin like a hamster in a birthday cake above the Institute later. That's the surprise. But his legs need magnets. I still thank the Lord to this day that this quest was boring as heck, because afterwards, the future of all Fallout 4 challenges changed. I learned about wire fences. You can spam them in place without moving. My treehouse prevented me from going crazy with it. One day I'll travel to Thrillville and take this game off the rails. Anyway, you know where I'm going now. Sentinel Sight. You won't believe me now. But this was worse than the first trip to the Glowing Sea. I could tell it was gonna go well as soon as I entered the bird. Step 1. I can't go to Sentinel Site, so I skipped to Step 3, which is going to the Sentinel Site by way of the Crater of Adam. I walked through hell. I walked through radiation. I walked through wind and rain to secure these nukes. Legendary ghouls and mole people guarded the entrance to the heart of the Sentinel. I pushed through them all, got to the door, and couldn't get inside because it was blocked off. I didn't talk to Scribe Halen yet. This entire game is a trick to make me feel like I'm contributing. She was supposed to go put the nukes down there after I talked to her. I only wasted about half an hour. 
I could have done some genie magic and console commanded the quest to fix me. You're all lucky that the third half of the 10th season of The Walking Dead was so comically bad that I didn't mind wasting a little more time doing this again. Adam's wrath fizzled out. I secured the objective, waited for the bus to come pick me up, flew home, and took a little detour. I wanted to see if I could kill the star of an overrated children's movie. Strong is not the man I thought he wasn't. I told the Elder that dance is synth trash and needs to be wiped out for being different. Strong, a super mutant, agreed with that statement, naturally. Good job, Bethesda. Halen made up for harming my life earlier by luring me down to the airborne basement for a pep talk and fat man ammo. I had a plan for how to deal with dance in a safe and Christianly manner. Obviously, he doesn't leave the outpost. I'll sneeze this entire f***ing cave system down around us both before he does. I deployed a series of mines, laid a trap that he couldn't possibly miss, talked him into facing the consequences for being born, and the f***er didn't even set off the mines. I ended him the old-fashioned way. Mixed in some futuristic torment by bringing him back to life just to kill him again, tried to do it again a third time, but the game crashed. What comes next will not be for the faint of heart. I had to report back to the Pridwin, so waiting at the outpost to allow the gunman to restock his closet would benefit me very much. I was more interested in the signal grenades than anything else. Going out with an odd number of grenades is a one-way ticket to an unpleasant evening. Before heading to Mass Fusion, there was one small matter left to attend to. I've been neglecting the railroad. Once I was in the church, I paid no mind to labels. I didn't care who was on anyone's side, I shot at everything that moved. Even got a new collarbone from a legendary friendly. The heart of the railroad headquarters was a funny substance-fueled explosive haze that went off without a hitch. Strong hasn't been faring too well lately. I noticed that every time we're in the sky, he's down on one knee, waiting to propose. He could be injured and I wouldn't know it. Pam didn't fight back. She had a run of bad luck, and now we're going to mass fusion. To ensure my survival, I told Ingram to stay behind. Didn't want her slowing our bird down, as I'm still playing on hard. Have put no points into Heavy Gunner to make miniguns better, and am about as inaccurate as I ever could be. The minigun was worthless. I used a missile launcher along the elevator to handle the synth machines. I'm one part immovable object, one part unstoppable force, and one part hypocrite, but that's not what you want to know about. You want to know about the Assault Trons and the Sentry Bot. I've known since before you were born that these f**ks would one day try to kill me, but what I didn't expect was that my death would come from me trying to kill them while they were still asleep. As for the radiation, it wasn't even the deadliest thing in the room. I didn't know turrets were in there before this playthrough. I'm never in there long enough for them to burrow down from the center to reach me. With the Rad X and radiation perks, the radiation was a minor annoyance at worst. The sentry bot used strong as a distraction just as I intended. Despite having like 45 stim packs, I still struggle to decide what to eat to heal myself. I learned the hard way that the game is still on hard, escaped mass fusion, flew back to the airport, and let the dawn of the real game begin. If you've made it this far into the video, first of all, congratulations. Second, you're aware of my feelings in general towards Liberty Prime. He sucks. I couldn't kill anything because I couldn't keep up with Liberty Prime. That would have been a good thing had he not gotten flustered with his coordinates. That was fun. Back in time, he learned his lesson. I took a friendly's gun. We arrived at CIT ruins. The iron monster blew a hole in the earth. I fell in. And the end began. If you're wondering, Strong doesn't really care what's going on, and neither does the game. Maxon, Ingram, and all of Star Command stayed by my side as we mowed down my son's family. Father had one last trick up his sleeve. He locked all the doors. The nutty professor unlocked the elevator for me. I rode up to face my future and legitimately forgot that I already killed Father. I had this whole thing planned. I was going to kill him with Kellogg's gun. It was going to be great. This is what he would have seen. Imagine that's the last thing you see before you die. What a fucking way to go out. I pumped myself full of every drink, chem, beverage and drink I had just before entering the reactor chamber, rigged the generator to explode, teleported to safety, and with Strong still by my side, I pretty much beat Fallout 4 while completely crippled and overencumbered. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord by going to mitten.land. Just type in mitten.land into your browser, it's not that hard. Follow me on Twitter, at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.